being a songwriter is probably uh, something that I've uh, challenged myself to do over the years because it uh, gave me the task of trying to um, distill my ideas into this limited format of a verse chorus verse chorus bridge type of traditional songwriting structure and you don't get to be long-winded you have to try and convey something in within some very tight boundaries and uh conversationally i've always had trouble doing that songwriting i'm given that challenge it's it's almost as if i uh, i saw something in myself that needed work and so <laughs> having to be a songwriter helped me with that Welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, licensed professional counselor. In today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with Bart Davenport. We're going to be jumping into all types of topics surrounding music. Yes, this is another of the special series I've been doing on music, but we go into so much more. The artistic process, beauty in the world, existentialism, melancholy, expressing oneself, playing live, learning and dealing with the opposites, the dialectics, and uh, getting into an artistic space. And Bart has some great advice uh, for people who are wanting to possibly dabble in music, whether or not as an amateur, a hobbyist, or as a professional. Bart Davenport might be a multitude of things, depending on whom you ask. He's been a mod, a blues singer, and a soft rock troubadour. He's an eclectic singer-songwriter with a timeless voice of a real crooner. He lives and creates in Los Angeles, California, formerly from Oakland and San Francisco. Smooth and yet curiously pointed, his work transports us to an imagined past or present filled with romantic odes and enigmatic characters. Davenport's stories are often a reflection of now, taking place in a fantasy world but conveying personal and universal truths. We're going to talk a lot about Bart's history coming up in Oakland, California and being involved in the 1990s garage and blues scenes, as well as his current work and a lot of things that I think will help you reflect on life because music is the universal language. Returning to acoustic guitars and 60s Baroque pop tones, Davenport recently tracked 12 new songs in his home studio. The result is an album called Episodes, which is his eighth proper solo album, and has already been released on Tapate Records out of Europe. It was released in March 2022, and as you'll find out, Bart has so many projects that you can listen to. You're going to love this interview, and we're going to interlace it with a lot of Bart Davenport's music. All right, let's get to the interview. Welcome to the podcast, Bart Davenport. Thank you so much for being here today. Hey, Paul. All right. Well, I'm, I'm pumped to interview you. Uh, as I just saw you on the stage here uh, back in March, you were playing double duty, uh, triple duty. You played some of one of your songs. You played uh, with Robin Hitchcock and you played with Kelly Stoltz at uh, Zebulon in L.A., Los Angeles. That was a really great show. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to do it. 
Yeah, I was very impressed with the uh, showmanship and the musicianship and the fact that you knew all these other songs that weren't even your songs uh, that you were playing, except for the one that you played for yourself. It was very, very good stuff. I think uh, it's been very important to my own songwriting to play other people's music as well. That's a really important... It, that's a really important piece of the puzzle because I have learned so much by performing other people's songs and then I'm able to incorporate some fresh ideas to my own songwriting, hopefully. Yeah. it's I, it, And not only that, it's uh, so much fun to... Uh, work as an accompanist and then switch gears and be the front person. It's hard to tell who is real in here. Come on, let's go. You've nothing to turn to now, everything's changed. Come on, let's go. Stop looking for. In everyone's gaze Come on, let's go What's the point in wasting time On people that you never know Come on, let's go I think that's a quite an interesting response. I can agree with that. I'm not a musician by trade, but I did play in a band for years in college where I was a backup keyboardist and singer and and that actually helped me learn a lot about what kind of songs I wanted to write and and what I liked and then I wrote my own songs for fun on the side too so I think that's it's really uh, versatile I this is you know uh, one of our episodes of this podcast where we talk about philosophy and psychology a lot we have a lot of music lovers out there so this is one of several podcasts on music and after that show, um, a bunch of my friends were saying, man, we knew about, you know, Robin and everything, but we had not known about much about Bart Davenport. And then everybody started taking a deep dive into your catalog. And so I took a deep dive into your catalog and I was profoundly impressed and excited to, uh, learn about it because all of the albums have like a different feel to them. Um, and so, yeah, I was I was just kind of amazed at that uh, and how you had pulled that off. It almost like it was the same voice, you know, your voice, but then uh, these different, t- com- completely different moods and, and and styles. And so that is kind of maybe where I'll start uh, because I one of your albums is turning twenty years old this year. Yes. Uh, Game Preserve, and it's actually being reissued on vinyl uh, by Love Monk Records. Can you t- explain a little bit about that and maybe maybe some comments about the different moods you've got going on in these albums? Yeah, well, uh, Game Preserve is my second album, my second solo album. And as a solo artist, I was kind of a late bloomer because I spent the 1990s from beginning to end as the lead singer of some bands uh the loved ones from 90 to 95 and then the kinetics from 95 to 99 and so during those years we did put records out and of course do a ton of touring and uh, live shows and everything. So it wasn't until my uh, my I was in my early 30s and uh, the new century began that I started to make solo albums and drifted into the role of the singer songwriter. Which prior to that, I was always just sort of the front person of a band. And so with Game Preserve being the second album, I came into it with a lot 
and I came, I had a lot of songs. I had forged this incredible partnership with the producer and bass player on most of the songs, John mm. Erickson. And we really wanted to make something special. So we booked the studio time. We had um, the luxury during those years to have this incredible community and scene around us, to have all these various different friends of ours play on the album, sing on the album. And it was a really special time and place that we captured. And we did it entirely analog using analog tape through analog boards. Uh, even the mix down was a 16 channel analog board from two inch tape to quarter inch tape. And it wasn't until the mastering process that we took the audio and put it into the digital realm. Then the album came out on compact disc on a brand new label that my friend, uh, Paul, also Paul K, Paul Kaler. Nice. Uh, Paul Kaler, uh, started this label called Antenna Farm, and we were uh, his first release. Uh, it, in fact, right alongside um, my friend Helen Renault's band, uh, they also put out a release. Uh, they released the two albums at the same time, and they launched the label with these records. But at the time, uh, LPs were, of course, really s slowing down, and people were still buying CDs, although downloading and streaming was definitely um, uh, com coming up, coming up. But we just only ever put it out on CD. That record ended up being licensed to a German label in Hamburg called BB Island and... Uh, very significantly, a Spanish label in Madrid called Mushroom Pillow. The, the record actually ended up doing pretty well in Spain through Mushroom Pillow. Uh, in the U.S., it didn't break out beyond California too much. And some of that probably had to do with the fact that Antenna Farm was a brand new label. Um, but of course in the Bay area, there was a lot of great response. I know they would play it on Calyx and things like that, but in general, um, uh, there was a sense that it was this effort that we, we'd done so much to make this, what we thought of as just this beautiful album and it didn't exactly become something that uh millions of people heard or anything like that euphoria is all you know wild wild seas will hide the soul all of the good and the bad times you ride like a seesaw wild loves prisoners all play charades you won't it always struck me that here we'd made this really analog thing and it was only ever available in a digital format. So 
Shindig magazine out of the UK, uh, their editor did a write up on this album, I think back in 2017. Or no, no, actually later than that. It must have been 2019. Yeah, 2019, I think. Uh, and their editor, John Mills, was speaking of the Game Preserve album in terms of it being kind of this overlooked gem, this kind of lost nugget, and that it did some things stylistically that were unique and unusual for the time, but then another generation uh, 15 years later or so had picked up on uh, doing things is doing some aesthetically similar things and uh, so it was sort of even though it's a very retro sounding record that really harkens back to the 70s he was pitching the idea that it was sort of ahead of its time in in being uh, in utilizing that kind of 1970s sound uh, in the early 2000s. <laughs> so uh, it dawned on me then and there that I should probably try to have an analog version of this available. And also, I love vinyl records. I collect them. I listen to them all the time. And that's my favorite format. So... Uh, I asked Love Monk, who have been putting out my more recent solo albums, if they'd be interested in a vinyl reissue. And uh, God bless them, they were interested. And we were able to go back to the quarter-inch tapes and remaster specifically for vinyl. And I think it sounds fantastic. It was really fun to get back in there and do that whole process get the the uh you have to bake the tape the tape has to be baked so that uh it because it may have congealed over the over the years oh my goodness and it has to be loosened up again so it can play and there's a whole process when you transfer and and do that so it was a lot of fun getting this on and going back to all this and now uh this is going to probably happen before your podcast airs, but me and uh, several of the people that are alumni from the album album's original sessions are going to put on two shows playing songs from it. Um, we're going to play Permanent Records in L.A., and we're going to play The Stork Club in Oakland. I'm sorry if that was really long-winded. <laughs> I like long-winded. Um, this okay. is a long-form podcast. Right. So sometimes when somebody tells a long story, I'll actually kind of break it up with a cool song in the middle or something. <laughs> okay, but I great. Think this is, I think this is great. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think this is exactly what listeners want to know. We want to know about, you know, the details of it. And I think the fun part about this is... A lot of the listeners uh, I know are in Cal. A lot of the, I can look at the map of where people download. There's a ton of downloads in California, Arizona, of course, where I am. A lot of downloads in the UK. So I think I think the fun part is everyone has like streaming on their phone, even if they aren't a music fan. <clears throat> Most people have access to that now. And they can just jump online and listen to your stuff. And if they like it, they can check out this album. I love listening to vinyl albums and. One of the reasons I love vinyl albums is not just the sound, but it's the fact that when I put on a vinyl album, I have to sit there and watch it so it doesn't like mess up the you know album at the end and my my record player doesn't break and 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 so it it forces me to lay down or sit or stand near my record player or read a book or something for an hour you know or forty five minutes and I feel like that. And in some ways, my theory about the vinyl revolution is that we now have a ritual that takes us away from TV and phones and texting and tasks. And we can just like bathe in the music because when I listen to an album and unfortunately I've listened to all of your stuff <laughs> on streaming <laughs> and, and I bought some of it on Bandcamp, but it's still a, you know, an MP3. I, 
I, I was, you know, running around and doing errands and whatnot. And, uh, but I still loved it. And, you know, it, you know, sometimes it, it's a blessing and a curse, right? I'm walking around listening to your newest album. And I was like, wow, I feel like this is really in the zeitgeist of the times. And I was like walking through Phoenix where I li- uh, live part of the year and oh. looking at the houses and thinking about the environment and, uh, you know, just, it was like beautiful. And then other times, you know, you're just driving around or, showing a friend or whatever, and it's on a phone, doesn't even have good speakers, you know? <laughs> so I, I love that you're putting that on a vinyl. And um, I really, I'm going to encourage all the listeners, I'm going to throw some samples all throughout this uh, podcast in of your songs, little little samples, but I'm going to encourage the listeners to listen to that one front to be, uh, finish, because uh, beginning to finish, because I don't, I don't know about the listeners, but a lot of people, you know, who aren't music listeners often just listen for that single on the radio. And I would encourage people with Bart Davenport's music to listen to the whole thing front to back because it's got this depth to it. And I feel like it brings you somewhere. And I, I and in today's world, if you can get brought anywhere that isn't some consumerist hell, I think it's a good place to go. So I'm going to say... When you're sad, it all seems moo. Pretty girls ain't even cute. When you're sad, when... Up, it all falls down. Your smile turns into a frown. Soon you're down again. But I know the happy day brigade, and they charge into my life like a gay parade. And I know the risk you take by making changes in your life that ain't so safe. Obsolete and uncool again But I know the day will come When we see more than what you wore Last night at a show And our love so precarious Will be there to protect us Listeners, I'm already endorsing this uh, To listen to Game Uh preserve it's got that 70s sound it sounds like it could have been made in the 70s and that was interesting to me because i i recently saw some concert footage of you performing one of the songs off of there and i was like oh my gosh i literally can't tell if this is san francisco in 2003 or santa monica in 77 it's hard to explain (laughs) what's going on there yeah 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 so uh yeah I'm, i'm glad you're sharing that i I guess since I want to keep asking some questions, I'm going to go with a current question and and sort of maybe a last 20 year question, which is this is something I've heard about uh, before with other musicians that are in your kind of circle is that somehow they're they're getting a lot of play in Spain and all over Europe, but not so much in the U.S. Can you talk to me a little bit about your experience kind of touring or selling records in Europe? Yeah, it's just sort of right place, right time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the case for most music careers. And of course, I suppose the majority of the time for most of us, it's wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> but uh, with Spain in particular, uh, there was a right place, right time moment. And that was that I was by a pretty random set of circumstances my sort of first band the loved ones got to tour spain in 1995 and uh to really pretty large enthusiastic audiences and this is something we had no idea that would happen we went there not knowing if anyone would come see us but it just and this was before everyone on earth was on the internet so we really had no way of tracking that or or knowing what to expect 
like nowadays, there's a lot of ways to predict looking online at, at certain things, what might happen for any given show that you put on all over the world. There's always that element of chance still, but there are ways now that you can see that. But back in 1995, we just had no idea if anyone was going to come see us. And incredibly, all the shows were packed and really enthusiastic. And I made connections during that tour that would last a lifetime. And uh, that I still, that are still part of my life now. And that audience, uh, quite a few, not, not maybe not all of them, but quite a few of those fans followed me into everything I did afterwards. And conveniently, some of them started labels. And so my, when, my solo career happened uh, uh, just in the, the very next decade. I was able to release new music there on Spanish labels. And it's a big difference because when you're on a label that's based in that country, it's a bit more like you're a local artist. So you have an in to maybe touring and playing some of the smaller towns and getting in just a little deeper than someone who's on an indie label based out of New York that just has a distribution deal in Spain. Now, those kinds of acts would often only just play Barcelona and Madrid and then move on to France. But for me getting deep in there with all this connection with the actual Spanish music scene, I can go there and play 12, 13 cities in a row, different, 13 different cities, uh, because of that connection with the local scene. And uh, I, it's just been such a blessing. And of course, it just happened kind of by accident. That's this kind of thing where you make some, you happen to be in a place the right year, the right week, the right day, connections are made, and things work out uh, in a way that uh, can continue to be a, a really positive thing. Uh, I would say that I would love it if that uh, had happened also in maybe Tokyo or <laughs> London <laughs> as well. Uh, and you know, maybe there's still time, <laughs> but, uh, the Europe thing has been interesting. Germany too has been a place where I've gotten to work. And my most recent solo album is uh, on a German label based out of Hamburg and those guys are really cool. They have great taste and um, a, a really amazing roster. Um, I th I think that there's a uh, there's uh, room for uh, artists who aren't super duper established in the states to maybe establish themselves in some small way in Europe. Uh, because at the end of the day, right, it's all about who you work with. So if you work with Europeans, you do stuff in Europe. But you have to be lucky enough to make connections with people there. And uh, again, like I said, right place, right time. Well, that's that's a good way of putting it. It's just interesting to me. Uh, I, it's just some other artists people might be familiar with. But uh, Josh Rouse had so much success in Europe that he moved there. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, I had met him when I was young and in bands around 2003 or four, and he moved there not long after that. And then yeah, Kelly yeah. Stoltz, who you're friends with and tour with a lot, um, also told me that, that he had all this sort of success in Europe where people were buying his albums and, you know, wanting him to tour. And I was just like, what in the world? Like, it's like this whole, like, 
underground thing. I mean, maybe it's the same way that Americans love, you know, European music when we hear like cool little bands out of London or Spain. I, um, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's interesting how things evolve in ways that you would have not imagined had you not made the connection, which is what I love that you said there, because I think in psychology, you know, a lot of times people, um, clients who are having rough times, they, they haven't made those connections, um, to, and with, with their art or with their whatever they were trying to put out in the world. And it's important to note that before the internet came out, you made a lot of connections there on a tour that you couldn't have imagined would have been like it was. And those relationships were key. And I think that's a key point that um, one of the key points from the psychology angle I hear is that relationships have been important to you in your career. And I see that because I, I look at, uh, you know, just for fun on the internet, I've, I've looked at some of your posts and you'll have like so many people saying, oh my gosh, Bart, I haven't, I, I remember seeing you 10 years ago and I can't wait to see you next month or whatever. Or you have like all these people, I don't know who they are. There must be people, you know, or maybe fans like kind of commenting on all these sort of things. Like, and I think that's part of music when you when you have an artist that puts their heart into something and and has the talent which you do i think people make a, a connection with them like a like i don't know what to call it energetic connection they just feel like ah oh, i like this artist or i like this band i like this person and they really feel connected and i think that helps sustain hopefully sustain artists throughout their career um just i'm just waxing poetic right now i have no idea what my point fully is but i'm just sort of reflecting what you were saying question i um i want to talk about more of your records but first i do want to ask you the old question that everybody asks which is kind of how how did you get started playing music you know as a as a child or whenever when did you start playing music and how did you know you wanted to do that you know well uh, that, that started for me like when i was about six okay <laughs> nice uh yeah, I, I just got totally obsessed with the Beatles when I was six years old. Uh, really earlier, I have these cassette tapes from when I was four or maybe even three, three and a half. I don't know. I've got these cassette tapes that my grandparents made of me singing Beatles songs when I was a toddler. I was totally obsessed with the Beatles. And uh, my dad bought me a guitar when I was six. Uh, it was so big and I was so intimidated by it that I didn't actually try to play it until I was eight. But then I started in earnest uh, learning to play the guitar at eight. And by the time I was nine, uh, my dad had set me up with two cassette tape recorders that you could feed one into the other. And, and he, we rigged it so that you could do overdubs. Oh, wow. So by nine years old, I was doing these Beatles songs and multi-tracking myself where I would play the rhythm guitar and 
do the lead vocal and then add on a harmony. So I would sing the John part and then go back on and overdub the Paul part and then maybe add some hand claps. And I, it's real crazy. Nine years old, I was doing that. So I knew what I wanted to do with my life as a child. That was that. And it was one of the few things that the adults around me encouraged and applauded. So I thought at a very early age, oh, this must be who I am. Wow. And so, you know, that is so cool in, in so many ways that you started so young and in and, and uh people actually were encouraging a music career. Uh you know, I it's funny because uh, <laughs> where I grew up and a lot of people, you know, when 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 you get a kid in, in middle school or high school that says, I want to be a musician, parents would scoff and say, Oh, you can't make any money being a musician, it's a hard life, exactly. blah blah blah. Which I mean, they I, should have told me actually. <laughs> they should have said that. <laughs> yeah, true. But you know, it, but it, you know, that's, that's the thing is like, if you follow your bliss and your love, is it about, you know, not everybody has the career of like Fleetwood Mac or the Beatles. Right. But, but it, is it, is it fulfilling? You know, that's the hard question. Is it a fulfilling life, you know, to do that? And is, can you get by with it? You know, that's the hard part. It's a golden time or so I'm told. It's an odd century. that they you know these were my parents being of that hippie boomer generation uh very much saw themselves as kind of anti-establishment and in those days when i was a kid there was still a really prevalent attitude amongst their generation at least pockets of it that uh, one should do whatever they please with their life. Uh, this may have been kind of a naive uh, idea. And of course, they had no idea the kind of economic struggles that the next generation and generations to come were going to experience. Uh, but at the same time, I, I ha you gotta, I have to thank them for encouraging me to be, to live an artistic life, because uh, I'm so grateful for that. It's, it's obviously one of the main things that I live to do. It's not everything in life, but it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot, and that gets very complicated because you get your identity in this world too wrapped up in what you do and then that can be hard because there becomes so much pressure on you to always be excelling at that um and there's nothing wrong with just living and not having to constantly produce something actually 
There's nothing wrong with doing nothing. But at the same time, it gave me something to do and, and it's brought me a lot of joy. It can be really stressful because, yeah, there's no money in it. Yes. So that that is interesting. Do you ever, I guess this is a maybe a, too personal, you don't have to answer this, but uh, do, do you ever have to do other jobs because of the, the, the economics of it? Absolutely. I have a day job now. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, okay. A- absolutely. I, I, I usually have a day job. Okay. And I do sessions. Uh, I back up other artists. I am part of a cover band that does weddings and private events. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do... I. I do lots and lots of music work that doesn't have to do with uh, composing or singing my own stuff. I do a lot of other people's music. Like I was saying earlier, uh, when you're talking about backing up Robin and and Kelly and stuff, I I love doing that sort of thing. And sometimes it pays. Uh, I've certainly gone through brief periods of my life where I was earning a living strictly from music. Uh, and I've been grateful for those. You know, I once had a song uh, licensed to a television ad that played during the Super Bowl. So uh, that sort of thing. I had another song that uh, in a band I was in called Honeycut. We licensed a track to Apple that they used for their um, uh, the install for their uh, operating system at one point like so uh these kinds of licenses with your recordings and things they come up and they pay well sometimes and then you can live off that for a while but the money does run out yeah because it's it's hard because you're right like a nine to five or whatever you're doing part-time or full-time you know it's consistent because your labor is consistent where the music it's like you know an artist that sells a painting can live off that for a while and like you got a song licensed and you live you can live off that for a while i i had friends in a psychedelic band when i was younger they were like mentors to me they're a band called calliope if you ever look them up they're kind of oh, fun and perfect. Uh, the, perfect that's a perfect name for a psych yeah. band they're uh, from Michigan, and that's where I was <laughs> yeah. from. And they uh, they had a song of licensed course. in the 1996 Olympics. Um, it became <laughs> one of the theme songs. And they got nice. $50,000 or more, I believe. And that's how they yeah. built their studio. And that's how they actually recorded all of their albums after that. Right, um, right, and, right. And they lived on I mean, they still all had to get jobs gradually. <laughs> they gradually all got jobs. That was in the 90s. and uh, But they were, they were a fun mentors to me. But they all ended up kind of dispersing and doing other things but um for a while they lived off that you know in the 90s 50,000 is like 100,000 probably yeah and uh nowadays uh those kinds of licenses don't pay as well as they used to back then so even though you have all this inflation and the cost of living is just skyrocketed since then and rents are like 10 times what they used to be in the 90s uh the, those those kinds of licenses now pay way less than they did then like literally the numbers are now lower wow so it's it's yeah it's not <laughs> it's not a good situation these days but uh that was the beauty of those times that mm-hmm. you could you could sync one song and you could do so much with it uh and uh that congrats to the i mean that's that's brilliant that they were able to do that and it's that's uh well michigan it's a tough michigan, market <laughs> yeah, but Michigan has a long history of incredible music. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a, there's a there's a I lot. Mean, I will freaking n- Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. Motown. Yeah. Yeah. Motown being yeah. the most popular. Then of course we've got one of the guys from the Eagles and you know Madonna yeah. and all that. I will. I won't name Hello. some of the other artists. M- MC Five and Stooges. MC5. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Iggy Pop. Yeah. He's yeah. from there. Um. Yeah. So yeah, it's a uh, it's. Uh, it's it's interesting how things change, especially with streaming, because I've actually been watching. I, I don't I, I don't know, but I'm assuming, I'm hoping your streaming numbers are going up every year uh, as people discover you. I don't know if that's the case, but hopefully after this podcast, that'll that'll help. Although streaming doesn't really pay much of anything, it isn't bad if you can get a check every month um, from streaming. Like I do, when I sleep the day through. 
When the color sacks wrap themselves around your heart And you can't escape no matter how you fall apart Give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up Give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up yeah, so I'm not really even with, with with streaming and stuff. I'm just like I honestly, I've grown so accustomed to earning so little at at this music game <laughs> that like honestly, I just look at streaming as this incredible. I still am in awe of this incredible thing that anyone all over the world could just like instantly go on there and listen so it's I, I i love that it's there and people can do that i love it i love that uh the 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 money yeah it would just be so nice to to earn more from it but it doesn't seem like that's the way it is i mean that's just not how it is right I, i'm who am i to i can't fix that but what i can do is be in awe of the fact that people are listening and and I lo- I love that you make something and then you put it on there and then like people at their own leisure can just go in there and and have a listen maybe if they listen on headphones yeah and like and- they're going to get a great experience hopefully i mean i'm trying to make this whole little sonic world for them to dive into and some of them actually are and to me, that's that's so exciting. That, that it's it's beautiful. Yeah, it's fun. I think that's the best part of it. That's one of the best things about technology that's come out. I've I, when I was a kid, I used to dream about. I, I I remember thinking I'd go to the video store and I was like, "What if you could just go on a computer?" But then I thought, <laughs> but back then I was on a you know it was modems, so I was like, "But yeah. it would take so long to download." That was my thought. You know, and now oh, it's yeah. like, you know, that's what I used to think. And I thought, what if there was music and you could just like find it, you know? And then of course it all happened. Of course I was like 12 having these thoughts in a, in a mall, you know? Anyway. See, you should have cop- copywritten that thing right then <laughs> in there. You know, it's, it's funny. I think I, I have a theory that people in the world come up with the same idea around the same time. Oh yeah. Just because of human evolution, uh, my, uh, I, I won't get, I'm going to not go on a tangent. Okay. Cause I'd have to cut that out, but <laughs> I've heard of some different things where people thought of things at the same time it was being copied copyrighted in silicon valley um yeah but well, you uh, know frank frank zappa yeah frank zappa i believe in the 80s went round and had meetings with all the major labels suggesting that they set up subscription services like you know, there used to be rec- the record clubs. Yeah, yeah. Where you would send them a check in the mail, and then they would mail LPs to you back. They would mail back like Columbia Records, oh, very famously that. had it. Yeah, and they'd send you five albums, and you know you saved money, and you just had to trust Columbia Records t- to put out cool records that you would enjoy listening to or whatever. I, and and but it was a subscription service. So he went round to all the major labels and pitched the idea of a subscription service that would be downloading digital files of the albums. And he did this way back in the 80s when the only way to download would have been these gigantic files. And you would have had to have done it through... uh, you know uh the, the phone the ethernet phone connection and very few people even had uh any kind of internet service yet at home uh but this was i think the late 80s he he came up with this um and i might be wrong on the timeline but he did pass away in the early 90s i think so uh, yeah somewhere in the 90s he so it yeah. must have been i i may have my timeline a little off but uh what from my what i think i remember the story goes is that it was like the late 80s when he went around and they were like uh, this is this is uh 
this is going to be too involved. No one's going to want to do this. I mean, no, I mean, and what we have to understand is that the average household still didn't have a computer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, so, uh, but he was thinking forward and it's interesting because he saw the future because of course, eventually you had, uh, uh, with iTunes, you had people, uh, downloading music onto their computers and not, and his whole thing was, let's do away with, <laughs> with physical product, which I'm actually against that to a certain degree because I really enjoy collecting records. But but he was seeing this kind of minimalist future where you wouldn't have to bother with that. You could just bring the information digitally into your home through the phones. And uh, they all rejected this idea that they were not on board with him at all. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing that his idea did eventually come to exist and and go beyond that that you don't even have to download anything you just stream uh stream the audio but now what is it it's a subscription right you pay apple once a month or you pay spotify or, or etc et to to bring the music through the internet into your home he totally thought of that way back in the 80s I love that. I mean, yeah, he was such an innovator. He's incredible, yeah. incredible yeah. thinker, very original. Uh, for people that don't know Frank Zappa, I think the best way to start with Frank Zappa, if you're interested in it, is, is actually just watch him interviewed. Just look, look up mm -hmm. interviews of him talking and you will become, an, I think, enthralled and then go to his music because he also just made his music the way he wanted to. And it's all amazing but also crazy like it's yeah it's, it's so different than anything at the time that it's just sounds i don't even know i like when i first heard frank zappa i was like what is this like i don't understand what's happening but it was amazing i, I was so moved by it um but yeah that's there's a, an incredible video of frank in the early 60s on the steve allen show uh playing the bicycle i heard of that yeah yeah <laughs> And it's before he had the the long hair and the, and the 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 freaky uh, look and everything. He was still, uh, you know, he's wearing like a suit and tie, has a short haircut. My dad actually went to college at the same time as him at the same college. Oh, really? A, 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 actually, junior college in Pomona, okay, California. So they probably ran across each other. Yeah, Frank had a reputation already that he was this weird guy who was into avant-garde music and recording and, and that he was uh, uh, really proactive and prolific and, and uh, he had a, he already had a reputation for sure. So my dad had, had heard about this guy, Frank, uh, maybe walked past him in the halls or whatever. He, he, they didn't become friends or anything. <laughs> That's so funny, like the world's yeah. like kind of small sometimes. <laughs> yeah. While I long for the weightlessness of space.
So, so yeah, I, I'm in, I've got some uh, questions coming up about you know live performances, but I kind of want to just talk about a couple of your records and mm, let's go back. Let's go forward to backward. Uh, the new solo album is called Episodes, which came out in 2022. And I have to say, I think it's quite a masterpiece. I mean, there are singles on there. Um, obviously, Easy Listeners is like quite a single, and it's oh. you, it's you in my mind are singles. But the rest mm-hmm, of it is yeah. is also just very very good to listen to. I think it captures, and something I wrote down was, it sort of captures this like, I think all your music does, but especially this album is like beautiful arrangements with, but like existential melancholy, but then like joy somehow, like a happy existentialist that that's kind of what i was picturing it i don't know if you meant to do that but i i'm definitely during this episode i'm gonna play just for people i'm gonna play actually i decided i'm gonna play the whole song of easy listeners just so people can hear it yeah great maybe right around now but i I was curious if you could reflect a little bit maybe on the arrangement but also the lyrics a little bit Mm, yeah Keep calm and keep up the pace Keep calm but don't be late As sure as the sun will rise The machine keeps churning Keep calm lonely citizens Be strong, don't be me Sure as the day is long Your time is coming To be adrift again in summer To be a resident of the breeze To long for something other Than just our own survival by degree Keep calm, easy listeners Keep tuning into your dreams True love is as infinite As a still winter's eve We fall like dominoes We rise like By degrees, by degrees. what it was like to write that 
I think it was the usual scenario in which I have music, a, a set of chord changes and a melody that I'm already coming up with just through trying things on the guitar and toying around. And I definitely wanted to do something with this kind of uh, quasi-samba kind of uh, strum and rhythm, uh, sort of vaguely Brazilian Brazilian influenced uh, rhythm, rhythmic feel and, and tone. Uh, and then I have to go through the process of writing a song to that music because unless I want to write an instrumental song, I'm going to have to <laughs> tell a story with, uh, with uh, vocals and, and lyrics. And, but so often I come up with a bit of music first and then I have to go through the hard part of uh, figuring out what this song is about. What does the song want to be? What does it want to say? What's the music telling me? What? And the music will often push me in a direction where I start to uh, try to uh, dig out what the story is in that music, and then and then and then write a little story for that. And and in the in the case of easy listeners, I think it began in that kind of melancholy mood where you're thinking back to simpler times, thinking back to uh, a time when I, I was less busy, when you could just kind of drift around for a while and take things in and and uh have time to kind of ponder a bit and uh how i'd love to get back there and it was coming from a moment pre-pandemic where i just felt like there's only 24 hours in a day and I just can't keep up with everything I seem to have to do constantly to hustle, to survive and to uh, get by and to keep up with the world around me. Uh, and being very nostalgic for those days years earlier where for whatever reason things used to move a bit slower and and there was kind of time to think about who you are and what you want to do or something like that it was kind of a sense of longing to get back there i didn't finish writing the song until i was deep in the lockdown phase and the irony of that is there was a lot of free time and so the lyrics took a bit of a turn in that when I was talking about to long for something other than just our own survival by degrees, uh, degrees of survival, like how, like <laughs> how well are you surviving? Mm. Uh, it became something a bit more serious in a way because we're now talking maybe a, a bit about surviving a pandemic <laughs> surviving a uh, surviving illness or something like or surviving that surviving or for who knows so surviving the isolation of lockdown or or surviving the test of that life through you at that moment so it took on a different turn, whereas before I was waxing nostalgic about being less busy. And then when I finished writing it, I was kind of waxing nostalgic just for a less troublesome time, Le a, less, uh, a less troubled era or something. So it, it, it took on more meaning as it went. And 
I, I, I always want to, I, I tend to want to write things that will hopefully last in that they could take on other meaning later, later on. Like you could apply this, you could apply this story to many other scenarios or something. It doesn't always have to be about a really specific thing, right? Right, it, it I feel shouldn't. I've, it shouldn't. No, really, I mean, I you want to use it for other stuff. Right? I feel like I connected with it, you know, just because I have always thought about this concept of the commodification of time, and that's something mm-hmm. I've been trying yeah. to figure out how to write about or make a podcast about. But that song really made me think about. I remember, you know, I I, I think most people can identify a time that hopefully, I mean, not most people, but most people in the U S and a certain economic middle class or something could identify a time where they felt free and like they could explore a little bit, maybe even if they were just kids, you know, but then, um, I remember in 2008, the quote unquote financial crisis, which you can watch movies about that. If you want to know what that was about, I remember time feeling like it sped up, right? Like it was like money and and things. It just took uh, like, it was like, I had to make more money. I had to hustle. I had to, and yeah. I, and, and I think with the phones, you know, blessing and curse, like, you know, we have access to all this information, but uh, every single thing is screaming for your attention. And I feel like if you don't, break away from that and take time away which takes sometimes days you know to to really take a break from work and 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 messages and things that your time is being taken and I, and I felt like that in the song it was almost like oh I just I want to just go back to like walking around the city for no reason and having coffee with a friend and talking to a stranger but I've got all these obligations and I've got a I've got to make money and I've got to stay safe and I've got to, you know, the climate problems and like all, I felt like that's the zeitgeist we're in. I think, I think one of the biggest, this is my own theory, but I think one of the biggest unknown crises, because it's not very obvious is that people don't have the time to decompress and therefore they're more stressed. And that leads to a host of problems, social problems, economic problems, physical, Mm -hmm. mental health. And I thought that song didn't even say any of those facts, but it just made me think of that. And I felt, uh, I felt it was very poignant. Uh, It's kind of the, the title and the idea that you would set, uh, this kind of message to, uh, what is quite obviously a very easy listening sounding groove right a very breezy easy listening kind of gentle samba esque feel and uh kind of feel good music and to set that uh to to set these lyrics against that is kind of the hopefully the interesting idea that uh we're longing for uh a bit of space to breathe mm. and longing for some t- uh to get back to a time when um you you can take it easy and yet uh we're not there and uh it has something to do with um uh the messages that are being uh, sent to uh, the media and society are are sending out to all of the people who are plugged in all the time. Mm. There's a lot, there's a lot of people that are constantly plugged in who are just devouring all this content uh, constantly interacting with it just constantly and um maybe quite a lot of times they just want to put something on that it gives them that feeling of that everything's going to be okay there's a that reassuring kind of uh gentle groove <laughs> you know so yeah. it's there's kind of a little bit of it like okay so uh here's Here's your mellow soundtrack to just 
chill out to, right? No stress. But in in reality, if you get at all into what I'm saying, it is a bit about uh, a, a, a critique of our uh, uh, of the stresses of modern life. So <laughs> it's it, I. I like to play with those kinds of uh, those kinds of tension. This, this, it's and, and I mean, this stuff isn't crazy at all. I mean, it's I don't make difficult music. <laughs> it's not avant garde, <laughs> but it is. Uh, I like to have those kinds of that uh, that little bit of tension there. Is it set the story to 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 a sound? That is makes the story a little bit cheeky, right? There should be a little bit of a, a nod and a wink. Yeah, it, it's it's true. There it was it's quite a juxtaposition with the the lyrics versus the music sounding like uh, you know uh, 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 Antonio Jobim's cousin, who's a singer songwriter <laughs> in L.A. You know, a little bit of that. Uh, right. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I love that. And I think a lot of the songs take on a story. And I think the cool part about when you're really, what I hear from you is your process. And you sort of said this to me on the phone one day was about how you were trying to let the song speak through you and, you know, whatever you're trying to figure out what the song has to say, it's kind of like your process. And, and to do that, you have to unplug, you have to set space and time away from maybe everybody but maybe your bandmate who might be in the same room with you or something playing another instrument or maybe just by yourself to to reflect and let the energy come through and i think that takes discipline um nowadays i think that perhaps humans used to do that more naturally when we were more of an agrarian society you and maybe they didn't mean to but they they you know when they weren't hauling in crops and the sun was setting they had time to sit by the fire or whatever it was right i mean i know that humans were also constantly busy in different ways but now in the modern life especially living in an urban city uh it's just a lot of pressure you know to be constantly plugged in like you said and so i'm, I'm glad that there's songwriters like you that do take the time to to i think at least pull away from the demands of whatever you're doing during the day to, to write these songs though they never saw me i could see plainly who they To sleep without dreams, without cares Billionaires I was out walking alone Downtown somewhere I saw them on the street Desperate souls With no trust in their name With no ties or relations to Billionaires Sailing away with the shares To sleep without dreams, without care Zuckerberg They were boarding a spaceship Escaping the earth Closing the hatch With no signs of regret At all 
billionaires, 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 billionaires. This is funny because I'm at one point marveling at this this futuristic world we're in where someone can stream my song anywhere on earth Mm -hmm. or practically anywhere (laughs) virtually anywhere but uh at the same time i am definitely lamenting another time in in which uh we could slow down and and uh take it easy a bit more so yeah it's a funny thing to be looking at at at, i don't know i don't know if there's hypocrisy in that or not but i would say nuance (laughs) yeah i would say i mean as a person in psychology i one of the biggest things that i've noticed over the years and it took me a long time to get into this concept and you know barring like murder and barbarous acts most things in the world that aren't abuse and neglect and exploitation seem to have a pro and a con but like almost in a pole you know like a black and a white but between the black and the white there's this whole rainbow of spectrums because that's where we come into play right how are we indulging in this because it it's so cool that everybody all over the world can listen to your song but there's so many things we could say about that. Like, why are the guys on Spotify on yachts and you aren't getting as much money off those plays? Or, but maybe on the positive side, maybe somebody in South America who's depressed heard Bart Davenport's catalog and they are now feeling good again. And then they saved up some money and bought one of your LPs and shipped it to Brazil. I don't know. I mean, yeah, all, yeah. we have the right to interact. And I do think in modern world today, one of the things I have to work on, one of the most difficult things, and I didn't used to have to work on this back in, uh, when I was younger. I, part of it's because I'm older and I have more responsibilities, but part of it is just the technology aspect and demands is that it is a discipline and a practice to unplug versus right. a discipline to be productive. Everything's egging us on or to just to be intentional with your time. Because if you wanted to, you could just sit on YouTube for the next 500 years and watch whatever people have put up there. So uh, I think, you know, to, to create a craft, whether it be a song or a wood carving or a cool uh, drawing or, or, or to do something takes intention and takes space. And I think music, in a way, is how we color time. You know, um, I may not be able to be a painter or a sculptor because I haven't put time into it and practiced it, but I can color the time of my day with some of your albums or somebody else's songs and and it makes my day better. Right. And so there's that. But then there's also there's so many other elements. We could keep going forever about all the different juxtapositions and and, and seemingly hypocritical or, or cross, you know, purposes you know and it's just it's so interesting in today's world that you if you've if you've lived long enough and you've been exposed to enough there's there's a lot of gray or rainbow in the world um there's not yeah. one thing to say about your song or the streaming services or records right oh uh, yeah you know and it, there's live music is has a lot of different qualities from recorded music and and performing live versus recording uh performing your own music versus uh doing cover songs there's there's no right or wrong way to do any of it and uh all of it comes with uh its own details so it's uh it can get a little overwhelming when you realize that anything might be cool <laughs> my hey yeah you know, yeah what do you want to do what you know There's a- i uh with recording i with with live music i like uh uh i like improvisation i like 
Um, I like dancing. I like all these things that have to do with it. Can you that really are part of the live experience um, with recorded music and with uh, composition and writing uh, and uh, lyric writing and these kinds of things. I like uh, trying to create little worlds for people to go into. Uh, I like that uh, that juxtaposition between the world to go into, which is the world of the recording versus the live experience is much more interactive. And yeah, we're there. Well, let's do this. Let's so do this together. <laughs> that brings me to a question. I was going to ask you to maybe talk about a couple of your favorite live experiences playing music live and, and what you liked about it and, and why. Oh, it's been, I've been at it for so long. Yeah. Right. That, well, how that long have you been just, playing that, live? That's... I mean, ever since maybe you you were in high school or uh well with an I audience in, yeah uh, i was in a choir at in my grade school wow that um that did performances in front of usually the parents mm -hmm. uh but our choir instructor was a jazz musician a jazz a pianist named Dick Whittington. And he had us kids, 10-year-old kids, singing jazz. Wow. So we were doing Ellington, Basie. We were doing the John Hendrix vocalese, uh, lyrical versions of songs like I remember we did song from my father by Horace Silver, which is a very sophisticated, very adult kind kind of song. Mm -hmm. uh, just amazing stuff. At, at the time, I didn't understand how sophisticated we were and how uh, you, unusual it was to have a choir instructor having these 10-year-old kids sing jazz. And I didn't, I didn't understand that. I just thought, oh, he's a grown up. He wants us to sing this kind of music. It's, it's pretty cool, I guess. I mean, I liked, I liked the Beatles, and I liked Michael Jackson, and I liked all these things that a ten year old. I liked Devo. I liked things that a ten year old would like, and. Uh, it was almost like Ellington and Basie was probably too sophisticated for my taste at 10 years old, but I certainly enjoyed doing it because it was singing and uh, it, looking back on it, it was such a great learning experience. It's just such a great way to get going as a singer to start with pretty challenging stuff. And we got to open for Bobby McFerrin. Really? And, uh, yeah. And then he let us come on stage and back him up on a song. And uh, that was at the Berkeley Community Theater when we were uh, in, in the small stage, I think, too. I don't know if it, now I don't remember what it was. It might have been a fundraising event or something that we were part of. But uh, it probably was that he would do that, like do a gig with the kids. Uh but yeah, it's it was uh, Berkeley at that time in uh, the early '80s. Uh, it was great. There was uh, I the school is called Malcolm X, and uh, obviously uh, it was that era in which the a lot of the teachers. Uh, had come out of the civil rights era and of course a lot of the kids there's a lot of black kids in the choir and um uh you you can make the assumption that quite a few had uh some background uh, with the church mm. so i there was so many good singers 
we might have just been a bunch of 10-year-old kids, but <laughs> there was really good singing going on. And Dick Whittington uh, had this vision to not just have the kids singing, I don't know, stuff from like Mary Poppins or whatever, which would have been cool. <laughs> just <Sure>. saying. <laughs> uh, that's good music too. But uh, he had this vision to have us doing uh, jazz. And uh, I didn't, th at the time, it didn't occur to me that this was special. I just thought, oh, this is choir and this is this is what you do. Uh, but now it's, I look back on it as incredibly informative and and uh, and I I love having that touch of jazz sensibility. I'm certainly not a jazz musician by any stretch, but uh, it has definitely been an influence over the years. And and I think starting at that that young with a bit of that influence has been gone a long way. I tend to use really rich chord voicings. <laughs> Um, certainly not your basic majors and minors all the time. I am an amateur musician, but I was noticing a lot of ninth and seventh and elevenths. Was I yeah. noticing that correctly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. got it. Okay, yeah, I, I, uh, I do love those chord voicings because they just they have so much resonance to them, and I feel like you can almost go anywhere melodically with those when you have that big of a key but there is that quote-unquote jazz sound that comes out of those chords sometimes not very different than the punk rock power chord uh lineup where there's mm -hmm. just a very mm -hmm. basic couple notes um well that that is a, quite a story i think it, it's interesting and i mean from a psychological a psychological standpoint um uh, you know what this podcast has a lot of influence about is i think it's the importance of getting kids involved in in act group activities and music, you know, I think it expands your consciousness. I mean, I don't think I know this, there's brain research on it. You know, getting your kids involved in music helps with coordination and, and thoughts and, uh, thinking and, and really, um, self-esteem because yeah, you're up on the to, stage, you know, they're supposed to do better with math and science if they study music. Uh, I've that's, been told that. That's correct. Yeah. Although I did not do well in those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that could have been from other factors, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> there are outliers. Yes, as we know. Yeah. I actually did a whole uh, episode where I was reading uh, a bunch of facts about music and the brain and having just playing music for fun or being part of a, a local choir or, um, dabbling on your own or with a friend or singing as a kid or even as an adult actually helps your brain even as an adult but as a kid it obviously has a bigger impact because you're developing and uh, you it's easier for your brain to learn skill when you're younger um so actually yeah that's that's a wonderful story i was curious about i'm just going to throw it out here since i'm on the topic was there is there any performance that just sticks out in your mind as like bart davenport or one of your uh, many bands you were in where you're just like man this was like it was like one of those transcendent moments, you know, I'm sure there's many, I mean, but I mean, just like one where you, I mean, sure the audience probably felt it, but where you were just like, wow, like this is, this show needs to not end. Like let's do five encores, you know, like one of those. I've been in town for a year of five. Feels like I'm still waiting to arrive. I'm a screenwriter. This modern love isn't modern art One day it hit me like a shot to the heart I need someone like you Someone to be sweet Gone, a 
on the spot it's hard to think That's of just true. uh just one to be honest <clears throat> but um i feel like i could talk about that i definitely live for those moments i feel like it's a uh, there's just those moments when it all comes together on stage where everything just seems to be coming together perfectly it could have to do with a lot of really uh, it, it could have to do with a a a a a, a, a a lot of factors like oh the monitor mix is really good or I just changed the strings on this guitar or something I mean there can be a lot of mundane factors that add to that perfect moment uh, but it's also just a, if the band is really in sync with each other or the audience is really responding if you really feel like you're comfortable up there and getting a chance to just go for it and not be stuck in your head over analyzing what you're doing or feeling self-conscious or any of that you just let it go get deep into the performance or something it's there's so i could tell you about dozens of times uh when i've had these moments that felt like that simply felt like what i imagine is like magic uh, i i could i could try and recall that there's so many of those that i it could i could easily recall dozens of them off the top of my head it's hard to choose one uh but you live for those uh, uh, as a performer. And I will say that it's something that's been kind of easier to do as a solo performer with just the acoustic guitar and being alone, like a folk singer. Uh, especially uh, touring Europe where you have audiences that will treat it like a recital and hmm. be very and not talk over you and be real quiet and attentive and really pay pay attention and 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 uh, really listen so it becomes like something like uh, giving a poetry reading or or maybe doing like a baroque recital or something where it's 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 treated like an art performance mm. and when uh conditions are just perfect like that you've got good sound on stage and you've got a great audience that's really there for you um you can then be free to try and really get into the songs and try and express something with them and tell a story with them try to feel something while try to feel something emotionally while you perform them and not just be going through the motions of performing the task of it's this chord and this melody or whatever but rather get into really the feeling and uh i've found over the years of course just due to kind of pragmatics and economics i've had to do about 80 percent of my touring alone anyway so that might have something to do with it but i felt like to have those really cathartic moments with a performance it's actually been a bit easier to have them in the circumstance of just being the solo performer because uh, once you introduce ensemble playing, which I also love to do, and I love playing with bands, it becomes this whole interaction between four, maybe five, six people. And then it can be harder to 
have that perfect moment when everyone's in sync with each other and we're all just like one brain or something. <laughs> this shared thing where all our synapses are firing at the same time and it's like the same pattern or something, <laughs> you know. And um, perhaps when that happens, it's even more uh, fulfilling or or even feels like more magical than the solo performance. But it's harder to uh, to produce and it's harder to reproduce over and over um because there's it's a more complex situation you add the number of people on stage and you add the kind of environments that bands play in um so uh i think some of uh my go-to moments uh when the magic happened a, a lot of them because i've done so much touring alone are the solo performances. Um, but that being said, yeah, I think there's a special, crazy magic that can that can go down when you've got the full band. So if that that makes any sense. I mean, I could talk about the time, the first time I ever played London or or the time the loved ones opened for John Lee Hooker or something, you know, there's, there's, there's so many memorable concerts in, in a long career like I've had. Um, but, uh, I, I, I do think that there's an interesting, uh, there's a, it's an interesting topic to look back at where and how and why those kind of cathartic, moments can happen on stage and the factors that lead to that and the circumstances I mean, I've, I've learned to understand that, that it's kind of like surfing right conditions have to be just right that's true that's true i like that that's a very good metaphor i i thought about that because uh i've been to my god I don't even know how many concerts. A thousand, maybe more. Uh, yeah, you I, can't, you've lost count. I, I've lost count. Plus, I used to play in bands. I was in bands from manically in bands from 2001 until 2008. And then I was in a solo kind of hobby play gigs around town kind of guy for fun until probably 2016 17 now i just kind of record because i have too many responsibilities and i don't feel like practicing that much <laughs> but i i think about your reflections on that and i've seen some bands and some shows where i was just like this is amazing the crowds into it the band is at least sober enough to have those moments <laughs> yeah. you know they're 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 just there you know and you can tell they Present. need it you know, present, they're present. Thank you. Yeah. And then I've been to shows where I've seen a band and I felt like they were just phoning it in and it was a bigger venue. Maybe they've had some fame by now and they're just like phoning it in. And I was like, this is terrible. Why am I even here? And it's like commodified or, or, or even going to a music festival, which I've only been to a few like Lollapalooza 20, 2005, and like some of the bands like really wanted it and they were hungry and just to play for that big of an audience and loved every moment and they put ever their heart into it. And there was other bands that I felt like they were like entitled, like, uh, I have to play Lollapalooza. What a drag, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and so imagine. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, <laughs> I, I feel like, but it, it's, uh, you never know, you know, when you show up to a show, I, I do love the mid size or smaller venues. Um, that I've seen bands in the ones that hold, you know, between 300 and 800 people. Like I love those venues. Cause I feel like you can really just feel the performance where, um, I don't, you know, recommend this, but like I, I have friends that have worked in the music industry. And so they used to get me tickets sometimes to like these big stadium shows, you know, just what the hell and they, and, and, and they gave me some tickets to bands. I won't name cause I don't want to have emails, hate emails coming in. And I was just like, this is like, this is what happens when a big corporation buys a small business, like this band like they've lost it, you know, and we're just like sitting there. We might as well just be listening to this, to the recording, 
you know, <laughs> and it was so boring and everyone was drinking like terrible beer and gross pretzels. And there was nothing where like when I, it, it's just a juxtaposition. I was, uh, there's a place called Crescent Ballroom in Phoenix. And the guy who started that, he's a, been a music fan for 30 years and he made it all about the sound and the, and the way you can see the show and everybody in the, sh- everybody in this venue can see the show, right? He's got these stairs in the back and he's got the laid out just right. So you can't be too far off stage. And the stage is kind of uh, got a little bit of a rounding to it and he's got the best food in town this like mexican menu and he just puts his heart into it right and i saw a band there i saw a punk band there on monday called cursive and it was just like everyone was just like hugging each other and it was like, beautiful right and then i compare that and i i remember i saw when you guys i saw you in la i brought some of my friends who hadn't ever seen your your uh well of course it was it was like you backing up people but and uh and that room was just full of these fans of you and Kelly and Robin Hitchcock. And it was just like a love fest. Uh, like all the people around us were just like, this is the best. Like, pe- I don't even know who these people were. People were tapping me on the shoulder. I love this song. I don't know. I'm like, who are you? You know? And then that, that <laughs> venue, that venue called Zebulon, they had the phenomenal menu and, and the people were just so nice that checked us in. And, you know, and I, I think about, you know, I don't know. It's just the magic was there. And yeah, the even, the owners of Zebulon are in really deep music fans. Yeah, it, it, yeah. you could tell because it was just everything was the mute. The volume was good, and then like I don't know, you guys had all these other friends. Like Jason Faulkner from Jellyfish jumped on stage at one point. Is that who that was? I think. Uh, yeah, or, Jason Faulkner. Yeah, he did. He did. He did jump on. Yeah, stage. Yeah, and I was like, "What is this?" I, I guess I, I, I'm not used to living. I'm not used to being in LA and having like you know semi celebrities jump on stage randomly when I'm at a show. You know, in Phoenix, that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen here. Um, but no. uh, yeah, but you guys killed it, and it was just like the audience is like you know, you could have kept playing for two more hours. You know, I don't think, you know, you guys you might've been tired by that point, but I feel like that kind of venue just brings it in. And, and the people that came, they weren't there looking for some sort of, you know, popularity scene either. I mean, to be fair, I'm going to age myself. It was, it was a little bit of an older crowd. And, and when the DJ came on later, all the young people came in at 10 or 45 or whatever it was <laughs> anyway, but I, I yeah. think that that uh that right there that you know that just can be magic so I, I i encourage listeners to go see live music support your local artists find out where the little arty artistic venues are that are some high school band go watch them it's it's good for you anyway these kids today are a lot like me and you were. seems like yesterday you were such a mystery ones used to play phoenix uh we used to come out to phoenix and play the rhythm room yes yes that's actually that's so funny that's where i saw sunny in the sunsets for the first time and i met kelly there and uh oh wow okay yeah back like oh 12 years ago it was about 2011 i think and the rhythm room was the biggest game in town they have all and they still do to this day have rhythm and blues artists all the time Um, we were playing there in the early 90s Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. The, rhythm, the rhythm room's got a history to it. And now there's probably, I don't know, seven more venues now. And that they used to it. book us out. They used to book us two nights in a row. Oh, we'd, play, yeah. we'd play a Friday and Saturday there. Gosh. And we would play 
two, three sets a night. They would have no other bands. We'd be the only band for the whole night. Because we, the Loved Ones was, it, more than anything else, a blues band. So we were expected at in that in those days and i think it's probably still true in certain pockets of uh whatever there is of a blues scene nowadays uh because i'm not really playing very many blues venues anymore right <laughs> but we were then uh but we were back then for sure and um you the whole thing was you'd be expected to come and be the only band for the whole night and just play a long time with breaks. But it was a Phoenix was so great because that venue was perfect for us. And we were drawing this wonderfully eclectic crowd mm. that would be, of course, blues fans, because it was the rhythm room. And at that time, they were booking mostly blues music. Um, I know they've expanded since then. Uh, and of course, the blues fans there, of course. And then we had all the different camps of the kind of retro crowds. So we had the rockabillies. We had the mods. We had the people that liked ska. We had some of the punk rockers of uh, the, I remember Bam Bam from the skate rock band jfa mm -hmm. uh, would always come out and see us uh and all of the uh, different subculture weirdos would hang out together at our show and that was really unique to phoenix it's still like that i have to tell you at the smaller venues that's so cool because that's exactly the central phoenix scene I've lived in Central Phoenix for a long time on an, I mean, I've lived here full time and I live here part time, but it's always been that way since I moved. It's just like, there's not, there's not many of us and we all wear different clothes. That's the funny part. So <laughs> I went to the show on Monday and I'm not even a huge punk rock fan, but I kind of wanted to see this band. And it was like, you had the punk rockers, you had the rockabilly people. Once again, you had like a bunch of nondescript, like working dudes mm -hmm. and ladies. It, it was just, it's just, I, I love Phoenix for that because people love music here. And that is, uh, and, and uh, hope, and I mean, and it's now become a hotbed of touring. I think I don't know yeah. what exactly conditions, but I know people used to skip Phoenix. Um, on the uh, tours. We never did. Right. We never <laughs> did. We'd stay all weekend. That's, that's great. Yeah. But I, I don't get, I don't get to go there much anymore. Um, in all honesty, I don't really tour in the United States, uh, very heavily anymore, but, uh, I, it's incredible how often Phoenix just kind of comes to mind for no real reason. And and it's it I go there so infrequently now that Phoenix has almost become uh, an imaginary place where uh, it's my my imagined Phoenix the Phoenix of the mind is kind of this odd. Uh, it's this odd and kind of peaceful place that's not intense at all. It's probably my imagined Phoenix is nothing like real Phoenix. <laughs> it's just Phoenix, like the city of Atlantis mm -hmm. it is. Or, or uh, you, you see, see what I'm getting at? You know? Oh, yes. It's like, or like the you imagined you know, life on Mars or something. It's like, I just have this phoenix now in my brain and it's this it's this place where uh everybody's happy <laughs> <laughs> well you know? everyone's happy and they're it's, not, it's not in intense the at all well it's a know? lot of transplants and so a lot yeah. of people are happy they're not shoveling snow in the midwest however in the last five years we've got a ton of california people that come here and complain <laughs> about the weather and i said oh, why yeah, did you too leave? hot well, you got no taxes, but now it's too hot for you. I don't <laughs> yeah. know what to tell you. you know, we're not that yeah. far away from you, from California, yeah. but uh, but yeah, it's, it's a dry heat. Yeah, it's 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 true. It's it's a dry heat. It's uh, it's there's no moisture. So we're almost about to hit the lightning round.
for the lightning round oh god okay oh god no okay. in the words of robin hitchcock oh god oh, oh. god oh god or robin oh god okay so what the lightning round is something i do to torture people and it only lasts about 10 minutes but it's also for the deep cut listeners because the deep cut listeners are the content hoovers they need to suck up as much content as possible and if you've listened to this point in the podcast you are one of those content people that love the information so what i'm going to do in this long form podcast is i'm going to name bart davenport albums i might even say something about it and then bart only gets 30 to 40 seconds to say something about the album is that okay yeah all right that's you're really challenging because as it has been proven I am incredibly long-winded. Same. I could talk to you probably for the next five hours if I didn't have to have <laughs> responsibilities. So I'm going to actually set my timer to hold Bart accountable, but probably not myself because that's how I roll. Um, so here we Lord. go. Here we go. <clears throat> Bart's other project, uh, you can check this out on streaming or buy the albums, Bart and the Bedazzled, Bart with the Ampersand and the Bedazzled, the album Blue Motel 2018, phenomenal album, love it. I think it's a concept album. I don't know if it's a concept album. It's freaking amazing. Bart. <laughs> this is me holding up the timer. Blue Motel. Blue Motel was the result of working with Aaron M. Olson, who produced it. And he has an incredible band called L.A. Takedown. And uh, that was a really special uh, album production because it was uh, sonically a huge collaboration with me and Aaron. 30 seconds. That was amazing. Listeners, check out Bart and the Bedazzled Blue Motel. I th showed to a few of my friends and they were obsessed. Bart and the Bedazzled, the latest release, People, Person, and Cardboard Man singles. It seems like you might have hung out with the people from earth girl helen brown is that the name yeah. of the group uh, right. that i yeah. saw in la a few years ago that i was amazed by i saw them by accident it was great uh love these singles super cool bart These are a couple of pretty cheeky songs, and uh, they're a bit absurd. And uh, one of them was so weird that I really didn't think I was the right lead singer for the song. So I got my great friend, Heidi Alexander, a.k.a. Earth Girl Helen Brown, to sing the lead vocal on it uh, in my stead. And uh, she did a fantastic job. Love it. Love it. 30 seconds. Download those singles. They're on Bandcamp. Now back to Bart Davenport's catalog. We're going to, we won't go all the way to the 90s. We're only going to go back to 2002. So let's go backwards. Physical World 2014. Love this album. I don't know why I love this album. I just do. And Dust in the Circuits, of course, is trending on Spotify as it's got 576,000 listens. Hopefully that's bought you a few coffees. Bart, take on Physical World. world was the result of me moving to LA and uh, putting together a, a, a new group so there was a lot of fresh uh, perspective and fresh sounds and also the songwriting took a real turn uh, as I uh, switched from being a NorCal to a SoCal resident 
Man, you're good uh, at this. Sorry, that was 30 seconds. Keep going. We have one more comment. I'll let you do it. Uh, 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 it's a uh, uh, physical world. Is a, you wouldn't maybe wouldn't guess it, but I was pretty heartbroken. Oh no! Okay. So, dust in the circuits of love. I did notice that song sounded melancholy about. And in a in a way that in a I was sort of heartbroken in that moment in a way that I'm not on other albums. Okay. Yeah, but I still I'll... try to have a sense of humor and make music that's pretty fun. Good deal. As I do. As I do. Good deal. Love it. Searching for Bart Davenport, 2011. I I have been. This has been going viral in my friend circle because you you cover. I believe it's all covers. Uh, really cool songs. Um, Come on, let's go by Broadcast. Cayman Islands by Kings of Convenience and a bunch of other ones. Are these all covers? I don't know. Um, or, but it's a really cool album. Ask me why Rambler ain't got no home Or ask me why say and cry alone So yeah, that was a, <laughs> that was a long story that I won't, don't have time to tell about how that album came into existence. But what I will say is it is an album of all covers intentionally made to be a covers album. And it's also the only album of mine that's entirely solo acoustic. So it is, if you saw me perform on tour in Europe alone with a guitar, it would sound a lot like that album. Beautiful. Uh, definitely listeners get into this palaces 2008 i know that you told me that kelly stoltz helped with some of this album i listened to this album and actually this sounded like a breakup album and very sad and it, i i was glad to listen to it but i felt i felt kind of like i was listening to a nick drake album a little bit even though it doesn't sound like nick drake thoughts young love a careless love Another summer flame Always I sing your praise But I don't want to play your game I'm way past grown Got my number on your little phone Hey, you're one like you Cuts right through Hey, you're one like you So I guess there are some sad songs on that album, but uh, I will tell you that I n- never heard it as a breakup album because I certainly wasn't going through a breakup when I wrote all those songs. There's maybe a couple that are. Uh, it's um, I had I had gone a, a, quite a while without making a, an album, so when I put that one together, I had a huge backlog of material to choose from and uh kelly stoltz helped me choose those songs and then he kind of co-produced the album and was there for the sessions for about half the songs nice okay uh maroon cocoon 2005 uh, yeah. my comments are uh, there are some really fun songs on this album really kind of funny and interesting uh, also, maybe a prediction, because you were apparently in Oakland or San Francisco and you recorded this. There's a song about L.A. girls and Glendale, which I believe is are both in Los yeah, Angeles. Yeah. And uh, finishing school, of course, is a very, a very uh, I don't know what I would call it, silly, fun, entertaining song. What are your thoughts on Maroon Cocoon? Sorry, I'm only giving you 30 seconds. Peace for enlightening round. There's no part of me that she won't try. Little bit weird like a dog on a roof 
Maroon Cocoon I, is one of my personal faves. And uh, it, I think, is it kind of is a precursor to the latest one, Episodes. I think there are some similarities in the kinds of stories I'm telling and in a kind of the approach to, because both were home recorded. So the approach to uh, um, uh, getting those performances down, uh, they were both done at home. Well, now you've just blown my mind because I did not realize they were uh, born uh, recorded at home. So that's phenomenal. Uh, game Preserve. Now, I'll let you have a few comments on this one, but we did kind of go into it. But uh, this one, to me, it sounds, like you said, like a, almost like a classic 70s, like well-produced album. It, it sounds like a time capsule, and I like it. Uh, Game Preserve is uh, in uh, the result of having um, a lot of time and budget to really make a proper studio album, and so uh, it, there's, uh, of course, no surprise. The end result is it's sonically of the highest quality, and uh, it's been it's being reissued right now so obviously there's going to be some people checking it out for the first time and I'm, I'm just quite proud of it love it bart davenport 2002 self-titled i feel like i don't want to comment on this because i want people to listen to it but what are your thoughts this is your first solo album Having just come out of being in bands for the previous decade uh, and for the first time getting out there as a, a singer-songwriter in that role, uh, this was a collection of uh, new songs and me uh, attempting to become a singer-songwriter. And uh, uh, I, I think quite a few of those songs still uh, really hold up. Uh, I still enjoy performing some of them, um, but it's it's definitely a first album. I think some really interesting things happened uh, sonically there. Uh, there's a lot more experimentation uh, on that record than uh, some of the ones that followed. So you get to hear a bit more kind of weird little synth overdubs. And I was collaborating with a really eclectic mix of... of uh, other musicians on that record so it's it's kind of a wild ride in a way but it's also very obviously a first album nice good analysis i'm almost done with the lightning round before i give you closing comments i did have to say that i wanted to point out the single from 2012 someone to dance and cheap words i found extremely catchy thoughts Uh, my dear friend, Mr. Sam Flax, produced those songs, and he played all the instruments on them. 
And all I did was sing and write the songs. So、oh. that is a real heavy duty collaboration where we're getting the Sam Flax sound and Bart Davenport's songs. And、uh, the, the, the big surprise on that was we made a video for Cheap Words, which is supposed to be a B side, but it kind of became the A side because the video. Drew a lot of attention to that song rather than the sort of rocker on the A side. And over the years, I, I, I definitely started to see that Cheap Words was kind of a deep song, and、uh, and the video really drove it home. I mean, it, it, it's definitely my、uh, best video in the sense of the story in, in the song being told as a video.、Um, It, it's just mission accomplished on that. And、uh, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a unique song, too. It's, it's got a vibe that I don't have on a lot of my other songs. It's, it's something kind of. It's something to do with kind of like. A, I, was, I was inspired by Johnny Thunder's、uh, You Can't Put Your Arms Around a Memory. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sad, but it's a bit kind of. Cynical and rock and roll y or something. Yes, I think it definitely、yeah. got people got to listen to it. So I, I did that at the end. I, I sometimes do this with, with people who have a lot of information in their minds that I need to get out is that I want people to see this the depth of the artistry and, and the stories that you told and the, the, the comments were phenomenal today. So、um, this is what I call my closing words. I mean, my closing words are obviously. You know, put Bart Davenport in your record collection. That's my comment to my listeners, which there's lots of them out there, hopefully.、Uh, depends on the episode、um, and where they live. But、uh, I think definitely worth checking out. And I think one of those artists that, you know, I think if you listen to popular music, you need to listen to Bart's songs twice because I, there's so much depth to it. You know, it's not like a call me maybe or whatever on the radio. It, it is, it's a deeper, deeper listen. So that's what I'll say as my closing comments. And Bart,、um, I often invite people to, to talk to the podcast audience. We do get kids listening to this show. I know that seems a little crazy, but some teenagers do listen to this show and, and other people that want to play music. So since you know, you're an expert in, in music, that's what you do a lot of. I'm curious if you could give life advice or music advice. Any advice for people out there who are wanting to play music and, and get into that, or, or maybe just you know, wanting to be in an artistic、uh, lifestyle? Well, I'd say don't,、uh, don't make it your career because the vast majority of us cannot earn a living.、Uh, but just get that out of the way.、Um, so just. Never have money be part of the equation. Think about all the other reasons you'd want to do it. And,、um, <clears throat> yeah. And is it, think about is it really for you? Because、uh, anyone should be able to play music. There's a long tradition in all cultures all over the world of, of folk music. And storytelling and sharing and all those things. And、uh, going back、uh, thousands upon thousands of years to, I'm sure, prehistoric humans were telling each other stories and singing each other songs. And, and, and that is something you don't have to have a career in music to participate in and find. The place where you feel inspired to put some work into it and, and, and follow that and, it's, and, and do that on whatever level、uh, feels right for you that you, can, that, you, that you can actually accomplish. So there's people interacting with music in all these different ways, right?、Uh, not everyone who performs music should write music. Not everyone is a natural born composer. Not everyone is a lyricist. You know, Elton John figured it out that he was a great composer, but he needed a lyricist. So he found a perfect partner in crime to write those songs、um, uh, in uh, Bernie Taupin. Uh, uh, Bert Bacharach had Hal David 
writing his lyrics. Um, and uh, some of my favorite singers and performers are not songwriters, right? I'm very into Dionne Warwick and mm-hmm. Dusty Springfield. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dionne and Dusty, it's just... I just hold them in the ho- at the highest, you know, and neither of them were writers. And as much as I love Leonard Cohen, he certainly doesn't move me like Dusty with the vocal performance. So uh, you, you get in where you, you try to really find what, what the right place is for yourself because uh, everything has a, a value. Like there's nothing wrong with playing cover songs at weddings. There's nothing wrong, you know, with uh, there's, there, there, there's, and like I said, anything can be cool if it's, if it's authentic and it has heart. So not everyone is a singer songwriter. Honestly, sometimes I think I was not born to be one. I was more just kind of a singer and performer musician but I came came up in an era when there seemed to be all this pressure to write what you perform. And so I forced myself to do it and tried over and over and over and failed. And eventually I got pretty good at it because I just didn't give up. But sometimes I wonder, uh, did I have, did I have to do that? Like, did I have to go down that road? Because I, I think there's so many good songs in the world and there's so many bad songs in the world written by people who, maybe just shouldn't be wasting their time when they could be covering all these amazing songs by other people. So you see what I mean? It's like, just figure out where you want to be and just try to get in and do that. Um, I, I, I just don't think there's any right or wrong way to do it, but you need to be authentic and have heart and, 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 and don't be a phony don't be a phony. Like if I sing with a British accent sometimes, it's because I grew up with the Beatles and and that is the accent that singing that you sing in. <laughs> because to me that's singing. If if I you know, I'm not it's not that I'm being phony. It's that that song sounds best sung in that accent. But I don't, I'm not pretending to be British. <laughs> you know? So uh, there's a lot of things like that. Like, you know, uh, there, uh, authenticity, I know, can be a kind of a subjective thing. But I, I, I really do feel that uh, strive to be authentic in whatever way you imagine it is. And, uh, and don't, you know, you could be, uh, you know, everyone has the right to make music. And, we certainly don't have to be professionals to do that. And there are great traditions of of independent music in that sense. Folk music, blues music, punk rock music, all these things that just do just uh I don't know. Yeah. There I I don't really uh I don't want to disparage people that do it as a hobby. Because here I am, think you know, trying to be a professional all my life, and it's still also kind of a hobby, <laughs> you know. So just, uh, uh, it's yours. It's yours to do what you want with it. It belongs to everyone. When Alice arrives. there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. Or take just a minute to give us a rating on iTunes. As most of you know, I am passionate about preventing future violence in the United States. 
My colleagues and I have started a nonprofit called the National Violence Prevention Hotline, a 501c3 organization. We are endeavoring to gain funding and collaborators so that we can start a 24-7 hotline and chat line to reach potential perpetrators before they act violently. It is a bold effort to save lives and curb violence by working to connect with potential offenders while they are in the planning stages of violence, help to de-escalate them, and provide resources so that they can get appropriate professional help. The National Violence Prevention Hotline is looking to open up a conversation about violence in society, the causes, and the solutions. You can learn more by visiting our website, www.violencepreventionhotline.org. Join us online by signing our petition on the website, sharing the website with your network of people, Donating to the cause if you like, and you can now even write your congressperson from our website with a simple form. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you are a therapist looking for ethical and excellent medical billing services, check out therapistbillingservicesllc.com. That's www.therapistbillingservicesllc.com. Billing services created by therapists for therapists. If you're looking for an EMDR International Association consultant, I am a consultant and I can provide you the 20 hours you need to become EMDRIA certified. I have groups online and in person and I do individual consultation. Just send me a message at the website and I'll get back to you. If you want to get trained in EMDR therapy, check out the great training opportunities with EMDR Training Solutions. I've worked with them before and they are phenomenal, so register today. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment at a local counseling center in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area at Health for Life Counseling and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest. And while these are based on the literature they have read and the experience in their fields, this should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you're in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988. You can also text 741741 and a live trained crisis counselor will respond. Did you know you could support your local bookstore by shopping at www.bookshop.org? You can order from the comfort of your own home online while supporting local brick and mortar businesses near you. If you are a therapist and you are not a member of your national or local therapy organizations such as the American Counseling Association or the American Mental Health Counselors Association, please get involved. At least pay the dues. It will help the lobbyists in our field keep us from becoming gig workers. And of course, there's the bonus of increasing mental health education around the United States and helping people understand what counseling is and promoting best practices within our profession. Until next time, I wish you all a safe and peaceful week. There's a bearded man paddling in his canoe Looks as if he has come all the way from the Cayman Islands These canals, it seems They all go in circles Places look the same And we're the only difference The wind is in your hair It's covering my view I'm holding on to you On a bike we've hired until tomorrow Someone could have 
chosen to go the length I've gone To spend just one day riding, holding on to you I never thought it would be this clear 